Hello and welcome to the recorded lecture on the parasympathetic nervous system and anticholinergics. So we've already talked about adrenergics, we've already talked about uh, sympathetic stimulation. So this one's going to dive in a little bit deeper into the parasympathetic medication uh, categories that we'll use uh, specific to respiratory therapy. So let's get started. So the parasympathetic nervous system is your primary system, and this one should be at baseline, right? This is going to be your baseline one that should be going all the time. Unless you're stressed for a test, this is going to be your rest and digest system. So this one is essential for life. Uh, your sympathetic is not essential for life. Uh, it is helpful if you're trying to preserve your life from any danger, but the, the sympathetic nervous system is not essential for life. However, the parasympathetic is because you need this to digest, you need this to metabolize, you need this to have your body absorb nutrition, you need this. Uh, when we're looking at this, there's very few synapses located in the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, and the synapses that you do have are located in the cranial and sacral regions. Looks like I want you to know that. It's located in the cranial and sacral regions. Once again, there's very few synapses in the parasympathetic nervous system, and they're located in the cranial and sacral regions. So this one's going to be a little bit different uh, because you have long preganglionic, long preganglionic, and short postganglionic. Remember, it's the opposite in sympathetic. So parasympathetic is long preganglionic and very short postganglionic, right? Long preganglionic, very short. And this one, as I just said a little bit ago, is essential for life. You do need this one. Uh, sympathetic, you don't need it to be alive. Uh, it could be helpful in preserving life, but you don't need it to be alive. However, you need to be able to digest. You need that uh, in your parasympathetic nervous system. So you need this one. And of course, the advantage of this one here besides your relax and digest part, is when you're looking at memorizing things, the only neurotransmitter you're looking at here is ACH. This is your acetylcholine. So it's the only neurotransmitter that you have to be concerned about when we're looking at the parasympathetic nervous system. So remember, long preganglionic, short postganglionic. Uh, the synapses are very few, but they're located in the cranial sacral regions. And this one is essential for life. So here is an image, and you might see something similar to this in your reading materials, uh, of what the effects are of the parasympathetic stimulation. You're going to have constriction of the pupils, which is the opposite of the sympathetic. Sympathetic would be dilation of the pupils. So this one's the pupils get smaller, right? Uh, so when we're looking at this, there would be meiosis, the smaller pupils. Uh, usually it will stimulate saliva, right? Saliva is part of that digestion component. And when we're looking at that digestion component, think about what other things that's going on in your relax and digest system. Well, one of the big ones here, especially for us, for respiratory therapy, is the bronchi, right? Your lungs, right? The little tubes in your lungs, which you should know what those are by now. The bronchi in your lungs will actually become smaller in diameter, smaller in radius. So they'll be constricted. Now, it doesn't say bronchospasm. Notice it doesn't say bronchospasm where they're just completely constricted to the point where there's hardly any gas flow. No, they're just going to a smaller state. When you're sitting there just listening to a lecture, uh, unless you're running on a treadmill while you're listening to this, uh, which I would hope you'd have better music than me. But anyway, uh, when you're listening to this, you're probably relaxing, hopefully, uh, and not stressing out. So your bronchi should be at a smaller radius. You're not using a high minute ventilation. You're not breathing deep and hard. And you don't need your lungs and your airways to be as wide open to uh, facilitate high minute ventilation. So you're going to have smaller constricted bronchi, right? That doesn't mean spasm. It just means smaller or constricted bronchi. The other thing here, this slows down your heartbeat, right? Takes it a little bit slower. This is your relax, right? This is your resting heartbeat. You're relaxed. Uh, and then finally, your GI system, right? And that's what we're looking at. The bladder, the bile release, the peristalsis, right? And secretion of gastric contents. So here we're looking at this GI uh, and urinary system, right? And that's really going to help that digestion. It's going to really stimulate your absorption of those nutrients and regulation of where those nutrients are going. So 
the peristalsis and the secretion of stomach acid and peristalsis, the movement of the bowels, bile release to help with digestion, bladder contracting, right? So that way uh, you're uh, allowed to eliminate as well. And then finally, you're going to see some reproductive parts to it as well, that relax and digestion. Uh, that's not our primary focus here, but we're going to look at our cholinergic response next. So when we're looking at the cholinergic response, uh, the big things are to look at for our purposes are what goes on with the heart, what goes on with the lungs, and then other things that can uh, be impacted there. Uh, it, the big one is, we'll start with is the heart. And the heart means the SA node and the AV junction. It's going to slow. Remember you have your SA node is what is your sinus node. So that starts the pathway. Well, the SA node will slow its conduction to the AV junction. So it's slowing this communication down. So what happens to your heart rate? Well, it automatically slows down a little bit, right? Now, when that happens as well, when that slows down, the contractility, the strength of the heart contraction also goes down. So what you would see here is not only a decrease in your heart rate, but you'd also see a decrease in your blood pressure. Now, we're not talking hypotension and bradycardia here. We're just talking to a resting, comfortable level, right? Big point to make there. We're not talking hypo... Uh, hypovolemia, bradycardia, right? We're not talking about hypotension, bradycardia. We're talking about just normal resting values, just like we talked about with the bronchi. The bronchi, you have your smooth muscle, and the smooth muscle will become smaller. So it goes from a bigger radius to a smaller radius, right? Now, does it mean that there's no airflow to move through there? No, there's plenty of airflow that moves through there, right? It's just at a smaller radius. And that's not a bad thing if you're relaxing. You don't, you're usually not breathing deep and fast. Your, your ventilation requirements are not really high when you're at rest traditionally. So therefore, do you really need, is it efficient for your body to keep it wide open all the time? No, it's efficient for it to be open for sure, and it's still open, but you don't need it to facilitate a high minute ventilation. So the smooth muscle will constrict. But we're not saying spasm here, right? That's the important important part here. We don't need it uh, to spasm. We just will have it constrict. Um, the mucus glands within our lungs as well will stimulate. Uh, so we have stimulation of our goblet cells and our submucosal glands. Remember those from pulmonary and peak, right? Goblet cells and submucosal glands will be stimulated. So that's going to help with increasing secretion production, right? Increasing secretion. So we're increasing secretions. Uh, and the advantage here is that protection and filtering mechanism. So we have more secretions, so there's less likelihood of a mucus plugging because we're creating lots of secretions. It's less likely to be a sticky uh, uh, and, and very spittable, so a lot less likely for that to happen. So increased secretions. And then that's going to be able to trap more pathogens or more dust particles, whatever you're inhaling that you shouldn't be inhaling. Uh, it should be able to help trap those and help mobilize those so you can get it out of your system. So it helps with that protection mechanism as well. And then finally down here, our last bullet point is saliva, right? Uh, so your salvation, uh, your saliva production, if you will, will increase, right? It'll increase saliva production down here. Uh, so that's one of the things that you're going to notice there. And that's a digestion mechanism. So that's one of those things that you'll see as part of this cholinergic response mechanism. Other effects that you're going to see, once again, this goes back to that picture to give you that overview. Then we'll just talk about a little bit more detail here. Uh, the eyes, uh, if you see this, the iris uh, will actually contract, right? You're going to have a smaller pupil, right? So you're going to have meiosis, right? Smaller pupil. So they get pinpoint, if you will. Not pinpoint uh, with everything, but just they will be smaller because you're not trying to uh, get as much light into your, um, into your field of vision to help see things. So it's just going to become a little bit smaller. So you're 
they will contract. And that's one of those things that we would see with those little babies. And I wish I put a picture in this PowerPoint on it, but there was a picture uh, published in Respiratory Care Journal uh, where they showed a baby that was getting an outrovent or ip ipotropium bromide nebulizer uh, by a face mask. And what happened is some of that medication got to the baby's eyes. Well, what happened to the eyes? Since it's a parasympatholytic, it blocked parasympathetic stimulation. So the pupils were actually dilated. They went to mydriasis. So they were dilated and you'll see the baby with these giant uh, pupils, right? And that's because you're blocking the parasympathetic nervous system, right? And therefore the pupils would dilate on that baby. So that's what you're looking at there. Uh, the other thing that you'll see here, so that's enough about the eyes, uh, is the ciliary uh, production. Uh, it will cause the ciliary activity to increase. And so that's why you'll see some of these patients where they'll still put it uh, atrovent as part of a, a thing that will be involved uh, for post-operative pulmonary pneumonias. It'll cause cilia to beat. It increases ciliary beat when we give them a, a parasympatholytic. Uh, sometimes it may slow it down. However, with a parasympathetic stimulation that's relax and digest, it might actually help ciliary beat or increase motility to help move things around. Your GI, we talked about this a little bit already. Uh, your GI tract will increase its motility. You're gonna have more digestion mechanisms going on. Uh, and then of course, what would I talk about GI without talking about this one? The sphincter will relax, right? Relaxation of the sphincter that allows for digestion to take place. That's as much detail I'm going in there. And then finally, your bladder would constrict, which allows for urination to happen as well. So those are all mechanisms to help with digestion. The last part here that I want you to sort of give a little bit of extra attention to uh, is the insulin. Uh, the insulin is a big thing here because this is where insulin production is increased. So we have increased insulin production. That's a good thing to know because a lot of our patients that are in our fight or flight state, what happens to the blood glucose? What happens to the blood sugars? They're really high. Like I was talking about in the other lecture, you'll see blood sugars that are in the 400s that are super high on some of these patients in sympathetic activity or their body's been given steroids, right? So what's happened is they don't have that insulin to help break down that blood sugar. In this area, we do have that production of insulin that does help break things down, that does help regulate that insulin. So uh, when you have parasympathetic or cholinergic response, then we're looking at an increase in insulin production and that helps with digestion, right? That's part of that whole digestion mechanism. So a little bit of terminology, the parasympathetic nervous system terminology, when we're looking at something being a cholinergic, which is the first one here, the cholinergic will cause stimulation of the acetylcholine receptors, acetylcholine receptors. So cholinergic means it stimulates the acetylcholine receptors. Once again, definition, you know I love definitions. Cholinergic causes stimulation of the ACH or acetylcholine receptors. If it's anti-cholinergic, once again, that prefix, anti means against, right? It means it will block the acetylcholine receptor sites. So it'll block the acetylcholine receptor sites. So that means now the dominant system, remember you can only have one system that's dominant at a time, either sympathetic or parasympathetic. So if we block the, the parasympathetic system, then the dominant system becomes sympathetic, which will, if we're given a drug like atrovin or ipotropium bromide or spireva, right, if we're blocking the ACH receptors, then that means the sympathetic will be the dominant one. It will have bronco relaxation. We'll have a wider area to allow for gas to move through. So a couple definitions. You know I'm always a fan of definitions. So let's look at parasympathetic nervous system receptors. Uh, so acetylcholine is produced and stored within the cholinergic nerve endings. And that sounds very familiar from the sympathetic one, right? Uh, it's produced and stored in the nerve endings, right? So when we have a nerve that gets stimulated, uh, that's going to be because of a release of an influx of calcium. Once again, 
calcium is the one that sort of starts that cascade and I believe we went over that slide previously in the sympathetic well there's one on the parasympathetic right where we show the calcium going in and and releasing those cholinergic uh, neurotransmitters to release right so a nerve gets stimulated and it's released with an influx of calcium when it's inactivated uh, what inactivates these right so when we're looking at this uh, it's going to be hydrolysis and hydrolysis is where we add a water molecule right we're adding a water molecule to whatever is going on and it splits up the ACH molecule right if it breaks up the party right this is that person uh, the party pooper right this is the one that breaks up the party if it breaks up that ACH molecule then the, the it'll terminate that stimulation altogether right you're not going to have stimulation anymore if you break up that molecule it no longer has the same effect on the person so hydrolysis where we just add water to it can help stop that and then finally we have our autoreceptors and autoreceptors uh, are inactivated by choline uh, and so what they do is they erase right auto receptors erase uh, and they're located on the presynaptic neuron so they're stimulated by ACH and they regulate and inhibit further release of it so it's an auto regulating system right so auto-regulating system so just like we talked about the parasympathetic uh, the parasympathetic has a system as well where it auto regulates where it will reabsorb or regulate uh, further release of it so it's not just continually releasing continually releasing it will regulate that release so autoreceptors they're on the presynaptic neuron they're stimulated by ACH but when they do stimulate when it is stimulated to release this autoreceptor will regulate how much ACH to release. It's a gatekeeper. It lets uh, only so much in at a time, right? Think of a crossing guard, only so many people at a time, and then they have to let the cars go, right? So that autoregulator is part of that, right? The autoreceptors are part of that regulation process. And so here's a picture from the book, right? Here you have the calcium channel. And calcium going into the into the neuron and then you have the acetylcholine getting stimulated and being released right and then it gets released to the receptors sites and then here you have this autoreceptor over here that's going to read how much is that down here and it's going to give that feedback and back to the neuron to regulate how much ACH we're going to release for this stimulation right so that's one way of looking at that regulation is that autoreceptor remember the other one is going to be hydrolysis that hydrolysis that breaks up that water uh, that water will break up that ACH molecule and that will stop that stimulation as well right now you're still going to have cholinesterase enzymes right that will be part of this whole thing but the big point here was to look at that autoregulation right that autoreceptor as well as understanding that there's hydrolysis that will be going on in here right water molecules uh, that will go in there and help break up that party and help regulate as well so you have a lot of that stuff that can go on and help with this stimulation make sure it's not excessive so what are the effects of acetylcholine on the parasympathetic nervous system well what we're going to talk about is a fancy word called muscarinic effects and muscarinic effect effects are going to be pretty significant because they will increase airway secretions so that can help with clearing secretions out of the airway because we're making more we can trap more pathogens we can trap more dust or whatever that we inhaled allergens we can trap those and help get them out of the system more so it's a it's part of your protection mechanism so airway secretions can be a good thing here we're not talking about hyper secretions like a bronchiectasis right um, but we're talking about just regular secretion production nothing above normal right we're not talking just like when we talk about bronchoconstriction we're not talking about bronchospasm we're just talking about them having a smaller radius well same thing here with an increase in airway secretions we're not talking about a massive amount where the patient's drowning in secretions we're just talking about hey going back to the baseline increased production that helps you be more efficient at keeping your body healthy especially your lungs 
So as far as muscarinic effects go, there is an increase in airway secretions. And also remember your heart rate decreases a little bit. Now we're not talking about bradycardia here. We're talking about your baseline heart rate, right? Your baseline heart rate here. And then finally, we're gonna see things with pupil constriction. We talked about that, especially with the, with the infant, little baby, right? Where their pupils would dilate with an atrovent nebulizer because we're blocking the parasympathetic stimulation. So pupils would constrict with uh, parasympathetic, right? They get smaller with parasympathetic stimulation. Uh, and obviously with muscarinic effects, your blood pressure would decrease, right? Because you don't need to send it to your brain, to your heart. You're not vasoconstricting. You're actually allowing for a lower blood pressure, that more relaxed blood pressure, right? So that could help bring down that blood pressure a little bit. You're going to have bronchoconstriction, right? Important point here, because remember, we're focusing more on the respiratory effects here. Uh, and the way that our medications would affect the respiratory stuff. So bronchoconstriction would be a part of this. Now there's obviously a nebulized agent that you may give, especially if you work in pulmonary function labs, uh, called the methicoline challenge, right? Or bronchoprovocation is the other term for it. When we do bronchoprovocation or methicoline challenge, we're actually giving a parasympathetic agent, right? We're giving something that will cause the airways to become smaller. Well, it, normally, if we go to a high enough concentration on you, even if you don't have reactive airways, we can cause a decreased flow rate eventually, right? If we just keep going and going and going with higher and higher concentrations. But with traditional bronchoprovocation or methicoline challenges, we're going to give you a small concentrations, very light concentrations, and we want to see how sensitive your airways are. Uh, and so that's going to help us understand how severe or how sensitive your bronchospasm is. If it's highly sensitive, we'll be able to quantify that early on, right? And so that helps us understand what's going on. Well, of course, we just caused a bronchospasm if this person is reactive to it. So then we have to reverse them, right? We're going to give them a bronchodilator, right, to help reverse them afterwards. But we, there's a situation in which you could be giving someone a parasympathetic affect medication on purpose. I know it sounds counterintuitive and trust me it is feels weird giving people medicine that you know will cause a bronchospasm right or you're pretty sure will at some point. Um, and so that's that. The next one here is that increase in mucus production. Remember we're not talking about hyper secretion. We're not talking about casts and mucus plugs here. We're talking about hey just your normal baseline secretions as well. So nothing to be concerned about there, right? If you're like, why would I give this? It's gonna cause them to have mucus plugs. No, not necessarily. We're just using it to help look at that bronchospasm effect when we're talking about bronchoprovocation. It's not gonna be enough increase in mucus production traditionally to be anything significant like a bronchiectasis type situation. All right, so let's talk about receptor sites. So muscarinic refers to the cholinergic receptor sites, right? We've already talked about this. Uh, there are subtypes of the cholinergic receptor sites, the muscarinic sites. Uh, and so anticholinergics will cause bronchodilation. We talked about anticholinergics. They'll cause bronchodilation. Uh, and they block the M1 and M3 receptors. So bronchodilators will block these two. So I'm going to put bronchodilators, BD, bronchodilators, right? Bronchodilators will block M1 and M2. So if we're blocking some of the muscarinic receptors, that means the dominant system there is going to be sympathetic, which will allow for bronchodilation, right? So we block the M1 and M3 and will allow for bronco dilation. So that's the whole point there. Remember we talked about this in the last lecture is manipulating the pathways uh, is the big thing with pharmacology blocking or manipulating the pathways to allow for better patient uh, outcomes hopefully. And that's what we're looking at here. So now let's start talking about these. M1 through M3 when we're looking at just M1 through M3 uh, they are in the lung. So that's, those are the primary ones that we're looking for the lung. So, so those are the ones that are located in the lung tissue. Uh, M2, if you're curious, uh, uh, is something that will stimulate the heart. Um, 
uh, as well. So M1 and M, M1 through M3 are in the lung. Uh, M2, if we block it, may actually increase acetylcholine, right? If we block M2, that could increase acetylcholine, uh, which is what we're trying to avoid if we're going to bronchodilate. So if you're like, Derek, why are we only blocking M1 and M3? Why not M2? Well, M2 would cause more cardiovascular changes, right? It's going to cause more cardiovascular changes. And M3 is your airway smooth muscle. So this is your airway smooth muscle. Right, your airway smooth muscle. So M3 is going to be the big one here for a smooth muscle. But um, when we have M3 stimulated instead of blocked, so if I, we were to stimulate M3 instead of blocking the stimulate, so we stimulated M3 on purpose, well, that's going to cause bronchoconstriction. That's going to cause secretion production. So when we give a medication like Spiriva that blocks M3 or t bromide, it blocks M3 that should allow for airway smooth muscle relaxation, right? Now another thing that can go on there is a decrease in airway secretions. So we just got to watch out and make sure that they don't plug or that they're still taking proper uh, hygiene protocols so that way they avoid uh, infections as much. But that's what we're looking at there. So the big ones are M1 through M3. M2, we try not to block that one because it has more cardiac effects. Uh, and uh, it is one of those things where it could actually increase uh, uh, the heart or change the cardiovascular uh, tone that we're looking in there by the facilitating acetylcholine. The M1, real quick, uh, the M1 is at the parasympathetic ganglia and it facilitates acetylcholine release which would then cause bronchoconstriction. And this one's usually caused by things uh, like rhinitis, right? Or uh, anything that increases secretions. So airway smooth muscle for M3, and we're looking at M1 being that parasympathetic ganglia that can also lead to bronchoconstriction. So we try to block those with the anti-muscarinic device, anti-muscarinic medications or anti-cholinergic medications, right? We're trying to block M1 and M3, because if we block those two, we're going to have less secretions and bronchodilation, right? Uh, so if we block M2, once again, that could increase acetylcholine production. So that's why we're just specific to M1 and M3 for the most part. Uh, M3, M4 and M5 are really not well studied, uh, but we know that if we're looking at this, we're looking primarily for our purposes at the lung tissue, which is M1 through M3. So when we're looking at the muscarinic receptor site, so we talked about being in the lung, but where in the lung, right? You want to know more. It's I can hear it out there. You're like, Derek, I want to know more about where these muscarinic receptor sites are located in the lungs because I'm a lung nerd. I need to know. Well, they're located in your larger conducting airways, right? Your trachea and bronchioles, right? So in your larger conducting airways, right? Your larger conducting airways. So they're not in your respiratory zone, right? They're not in your respiratory zone, right? Crossing out the respiratory zone. So these are going to be in your trachea, your bronchi, right? So they're going to be in your larger airways, Right? So this is why we can use a dry powder inhaler like Spiriva comes in that allows uh, for better inertial impaction uh, there for the larger airways. Less of it will get to the smaller airways where they really won't be as useful. Uh, but there is other things like respiratory mats out there that will still be just good for that. But remember, cholinergic fibers are more abundant in the hyalur region. This area right here, let me go to red here. I'll circle it in red this hyalur region, right? These are the areas that will give you your butterfly or bat wing pattern when they're, uh, when they have heart failure on a patient or they have cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, right? That's that hyalur region, that area right outside those main bronchi, right? So that's that hyalur region. So most of the cholinergic fibers are abundant in the hyalur region in this area here that I'm trying to circle, right? So in that area, and you're going to have lots of lymph tissue in that area as well, um, but this is primarily what you're going to be seeing there, is most of those cholinergic fibers, like I said, larger conducting airways, trachea, bronchioles, and so that's going to be our target location 
uh, for either blocking or if we need to stimulating these as well. All right, so here you see the giant picture of the, the preganglionic and postganglionic. Remember, acetylcholine is released both preganglionic and postganglionic here. And then you see the preganglionic nerve releasing uh, the muscarinic 1 receptor. Uh, and then it goes into the nicotinic. Here's something to circle and highlight. Nicotinic receptor the nicotinic receptor. Once again, the nicotinic receptor. That's going to come in very handy in the near future. Okay, so it releases it to the nicotinic receptor. Uh, then it goes through the postganglionic nerve, and then M2 is released, right? M2 is in there, and it releases that acetylcholine again. Remember, it's postganglionic and preganglionic in the parasympathetic. And we're going to go to M3, which is going to be your mucus gland production, right? So that's your goblet cells, submucosal glands. Uh, M3 uh, is also going to be your smooth muscle, right? It'll cause smooth muscle contraction because we're stimulating. We're not blocking. We're stimulating it with the parasympathetic nervous system. And then M3 will also allow for vasodilation in the lungs, vasodilation in the lungs, right? So it allows for the endothelium relaxation. So it allows for that, that, that blood vessels in your lungs to dilate and relax, which is the opposite in sympathetic, where we have pulmonary vasoconstriction with that situation. So let's talk about medications that block the parasympathetic nervous system. So when we're looking at these, these are also known as anticholinergics, or in my favorite way is calling them parasympatho lytics. Remember that suffix lytic means to block. Uh, so these are anti-muscarinics, anticholinergics, parasympathetics. Those are all synonyms for the same thing. Uh, once again, I don't come up with these synonyms. They are pre-existing before me, so you are tasked with knowing them because I want you to understand uh, where they're coming from when, if they use different phrasing out there. So Drugs that stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, right, are going to be called cholinergics, right? Uh, parasympathomimetic, right, where it mimics, right, or it mimics it, or known as just a muscarinic, right? And we do this, right? We talked about this with our methacholine challenge, right? The methacholine will mimic, right, that parasympathetic stimulation and then could cause or show sensitivity uh, to things like bronchospasm and help us understand how sensitive and quantify how sensitive someone's airways are. So let's talk about cholinergic. There are two types of drugs, so cholinergic drugs, right, I'll just do this. There we go. There are two types of cholinergic drugs. Uh, there's direct acting and indirect acting. So direct acting and indirect acting. So direct acting drugs will mimic acetylcholine. They mimic acetylcholine. They will bind directly to the muscarinic receptor, right? Uh, so these will mimic acetylcholine and bind directly to the muscarinic receptor. Our next one here is indirect acting. Indirect acting, uh, this one inhibits the cholinesterase enzyme. And we went, if you go back to that previous slide, uh, a couple of slides ago, you'll see the cholinesterase where we talked about hydrolysis breaking down and then there was the cholinesterase hanging in there. Well, now we get to talk about the cholinesterase a little bit. It will inhibit the cholinesterase enzyme. So what does the cholinesterase enzyme do? Well, it helps break that down, right? It helps break down acetylcholine and limit the effect as well. So these ones are inhibiting the cholinesterase enzyme. So Postagnine, neostagmine, and tensilin are some of the big ones here. Uh, remember with neostagmine uh, and tensilin, uh, neostagmine, remember, will reverse a neuromuscular blockade. When we start talking about paralytics, you're going to need to remember this. I guarantee you'll see that medication in the near future. Uh, and then uh, when we're looking at the tensilin test, that's something that we would use to help with diagnosis of myasthenia gravis, right? Remember that whole thing 
where it's a descending paralysis from the mind to the ground, right? So you'll see some of these drugs out there. And so they would inhibit the cholinesterase enzyme to allow for that stimulation to go on, right? So what type of medication are we going to use that is direct acting that you might use nebulized as a respiratory provider? Well, that's going to be the methacholine challenge, right? So direct acting, think methacholine challenge, right? Or you could call it bronchoprovocation, whichever term you like to do there. Uh, bronchoprovocation is a more broad term that involves, you could use cold air, you can use a histamine, you can use methacholine, but methacholine is traditionally the most common one that's used there. Uh, for this indirect acting category, right, the indirect acting category, we're looking at things like eye exams that will constrict pupils, right? So that's something that's easily, uh, that you might see at a eye doctor, right? Or um, when we're looking at neostigmine, it could actually increase airway secretions. And even the tensilin test, right, can increase mu muscle strength in myasthenia gravis. However, it's short acting. Um, so it's more used for diagnostic purposes than therapeutic purposes traditionally. But uh, that's where you're seeing those indirect acting. So if you're like, Derek, give me some examples of direct acting. There you go, methacholine would be one. And then indirect acting, uh, the, the medications that you get from the eye doctor that would constrict the pupils, not the dilation one, the constrict one, right? Uh, it, anything that increases air with secretions, muscle strength with tensilin, or decreasing the neuromuscular blockade with neostigmine uh, for those patients that are on a blockade. So let's talk anticholinergics, right? So we just talked about what would the effect be and what medications we would give that were cholinergic. Now we're going to go anticholinergic. So these are anticholinergic. So the whole point here is to block, right? Anticholinergics will bind themselves and block, right? Bind themselves and block. So the parasympatholytics, right? That lytic, that suffix, right? Means block. Uh, there we go. There's uh, underline it. Uh, it will block that basal level bronchomotor tone. What does that mean? That means that we're going to inhibit the bronchoconstriction, not the, right, just that natural relaxed small radius state. We're just going to inhibit it from going to a small radius state. So that means we're going to try to keep it open if we can, right? So the degree of bronchodilation in this really does depend on the amount of parasympathetic tone that's present in the airway. If there's hardly any parasympathetic tone present in the airway, then we may not have any effect at all, right? If there's quite a bit of it, then we might have some effect. There's only one system that is dominant at a time. And so if your sympathetic system is dominant and I give you a parasympatholytic, it may not make much of a difference to your radius of your airways. But if your parasympathetic system is currently dominant and I give you something that blocks parasympathetic stimulation specific to the respiratory, uh, M1 and M3 receptors, then you might have pretty good baseline effects. And that's what we've seen with people that were on Spiriva, that were on t bromide, right? But the whole point here is to block the action of acetylcholine, right? We're trying to stop this uh, uh, ACH from going anywhere. So we're going to try to block it, right, by going to where it's supposed to go, and then we're going to take up a space there, right? We're going to stop it from having any effect. So therefore, what's left would be uh, sympathetic stimulation, right? What's left would be sympathetic. So we're trying to block it from having any effect. So our whole point is to take ACH and close it in, right? To stop it from doing anything there. So when we have an anticholinergic, it will form bonds with acetylcholinesterase, right? That's the enzyme. And this is your indirect, right? We talked about direct versus indirect. This is indirect, right? Indirect. Uh, there are some are what's considered irreversible. Um, so these were ones um, uh, medications that were used in chemical warfare uh, when we're looking at that, like the uh, sarin gas and stuff like that. 
So that would be a very, very si serious situation it would call sludge syndrome. Sludge syndrome. Uh, so how would this affect the body? Well, if there's a cholinergic crisis, you can have sludge syndrome. And so we'll talk more about a cholinergic crisis uh, in class as well. But what you're going to see is a decreased heart rate. A decreased blood pressure, bronchoconstriction, right? And then what would happen is these patients would eventually suffocate on their own secretions because it's hypersecreting at this point. It's crazy. All right, so other things that we need to look at here with anticholinergics is what they do is they compete with acetylcholine. They're going to compete for that same binding site. Um, so what the anticholinergics do is they go to that receptor site and they block it. They stop that receptor site from being stimulated by acetylcholine. So they're, they go they bind to that site, they take up its parking space. Imagine trying to pull into a, a store you really want to go to, and someone pulls in ahead of you and they, they block your parking spot. Well, that, that's exactly how acetylcholine feels when this happens, right? They block that spot, and so therefore, you don't get to park there, right? You don't get the effect that you were looking for, right? And same thing happens here. These anticholinergics will go to that muscarinic receptor site and block anything from going there. So why would you want to do this? Well, the big thing is uh, medications. Like let's say you have someone that has a bradycardia and their blood pressure is low, they have altered mental status. Well, we would call that symptomatic bradycardia, symptomatic bradycardia, right? If they have symptomatic bradycardia, but then we want to give them a medication to help reverse that, that would block that, that parasympathetic stimulation, that acetylcholine uh, effect. Now, I wonder what drug is used for blocking that. Umbecha, it starts with an A, right? Right, a little bit of atropine. Right, your atropine would be your big medication that's in that class. So symptomatic bradycardia would be the big one there. Um, so that would be one to do, right? If someone has a symptomatic bradycardia, we could do that, especially if we don't want to do pacing or anything like that. So we can look at that one. Another one that we can look at here would be bronchospasm, right? If we have someone that's in a bronchospasm, so this medication, we could actually give them a medication for bronchospasm. So I'll just do bronchospasm is what that stands for. Don't let it think anything else. Bronchospasm. So bronchospasm, if someone's in a bronchospasm, we can bind to that muscarinic receptor site and hopefully help reverse any acetylcholine from going to any of the receptor sites. Therefore, what becomes more dominant would be the sympathetic stimulation. So this would be things like your spareva, your teatropium bromide, or your atrovent, or ipatropium bromide, right? And so the whole point there is for bronchospasm, right? Once again, the BS stands for bronchospasm, um, is to help uh, bind to those muscarinic recites. So that way the dominant system will have to be sympathetic. It will have to be the one that allows for bronco dilation, right? So that would be your teatropium bromide at baseline or your uh, ipatropium bromide that we can add to nebulizers, including continuous nebulizers as well. So what are some anticholinergic effects? And we've already talked about this a little bit before with the cholinergic effects. So now this is going to usually be traditionally the inverse here. Uh, if we're blocking the parasympathetic stimulation, right, anti, right, if we're blocking it, then we're going to have less secretions. So we're going to dry them out, right? So there's going to be a lot more drying secretions. So is there a potential downside to this? Yeah, there's more potential for mucus plugging. So airway clearance therapy and proper systemic hydration become very important. Airway humidity, if they're on a high flow device, 
whether it's high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation, even invasive ventilation, you should have good humidity. But if they're on an anticholinergic drug or a parasympathetic drug or anything like that, uh, do make sure they have proper systemic hydration and proper uh, ability to have humidified secretions because otherwise you could have an issue with mucus plugging. So if their mucus is thick and sticky, we need to approach that. It may not mean taking them off that medication. It might mean just adding more humidity or adding uh, more systemic hydration to that patient. Other things too, if we're blocking um, the cholinergic effects, uh, the heart rate will go up. Well, that, that's kind of the whole point of atropine, right? When they give atropine IV, right, when they give atropine IV, I don't know what I'm doing there. When they give atropine IV, uh, that's going to be the big thing there is to help bring that heart rate out of that symptomatic bradycardia. So when we're looking at atropine, that's kind of the intended effect to increase the heart rate. The other thing, it should block smooth muscle constriction. And that's kind of the point here with our respiratory medications, our topical ones that we give the patient, right? So we give them, we're not just going to give them atropine atropine uh, IV for uh, smooth muscle, uh, to block smooth muscle, right? That's going to cause a drastic systemic change, right? We try to go topical with these medications so there's less effect. So blocking smooth muscle constriction is going to be one of our big things that we use for inhaled respiratory medications. Uh, the, we will have relaxation of the corneal reflex. That's a natural thing that you'll see there with anticholinergics. Uh, so you can see their pupils dilate, like what I talked about earlier with that little baby, right? And then finally, you might have what's called atropine flush, which if you have a large dose, um, uh, you could have massive dilation of the blood vessels. And so if you massively dilate the blood vessels, what happens to the pressure inside the vessel, right? You go from a smaller vessel to a larger vessel. If the container gets bigger, the pressure inside decreases. And so what happens to blood pressure? Uh, well, it decreases. And then what happens to the amount of perfusion going to the brain, right? What happens to all that stuff? Uh, so uh, the kidneys, all those things. So there could be a potential hypotension effect as well that you have to worry about. All right, so there's two types of compounds that we like to talk about, uh, tertiary versus quaternary. So tertiary versus quaternary, all right? So tertiary is very easily absorbed, right? Very easily absorbed in the bloodstream, and it does cross the blood-brain barrier. So when we're crossing that blood-brain barrier, uh, things like atropine and scopolamine would be ones in this in this category atropine and scopolamine you might have heard of scopolamine people use it for motion sickness but we can also use it to help dry out secretions as well and those would be tertiary compounds right so with the respiratory tract we're going to see dilation of the respiratory tract uh, with cns it can cause altered cns effects and that's where scopolamine right where we talked about that the patient has too much in that system, it can alter their mental status uh, a little bit. Uh, eyes would be dilated, right? It can dilate their pupils. Uh, cardiac, it will decrease uh, smooth muscle. Uh, so you might see uh, a change there. And then it will slow down and it will cause urinary ret retention. And dry, uh, dry mouth is another common thing that you would see here. So all of those are those effect of those tertiary ammonium uh, compounds. So slows down that slows down uh, the urinary production and leads to urinary retention and can cause a dry mouth. So there are potential effects of the tertiary ammonium compounds. Once again, tertiary are very easily absorbed in the bloodstream. They do cross the blood-brain barrier, hence the altered mental status, right? CNS, right? Altered mental status. They do cross that blood-brain barrier. Um, the advantage of quaternary, moving over to the quaternary, uh, the quaternary are usually very poorly absorbed in your bloodstream in CNS, which can be better for inhalation medications, right? Uh, the two drugs in this category that I want you to think about that are quaternary compounds would be ipatropium and teatropium bromide. So atrovent and spiriva, right? 
ipatropium and teatropium bromide would be the ones here. So their effect, they'll cause respiratory tract dilation. So it does have bronchodilation, right? But CNS, right, a central nervous system effect, no altered mental status. Uh, eyes, uh, no effect traditionally unless you're like dropping it in their eyes somehow. Uh, cardiac effect, hardly any cardiac effect, right, compared to the other one. Uh, GI, uh, you probably still have a dry mouth with this one. Right, because you're giving it inhaled, right, so you're probably still have that dry mouth from that. But that's the advantage of the quaternary, right? So quaternary is poorly absorbed in the bloodstream in the CNS, so less side effects. Um, tertiary compounds, very easily absorbed in the bloodstream, will cross the blood-brain barrier and has more CNS effects, like we see with atropine and scopolamine with those tertiary compounds. So hopefully you get a good compare and contrast between tertiary and quaternary and why we would use quaternary more for that inhaled topical and tertiary for more of a systemic effect like symptomatic bradycardia or massive secretion production or things like that. So when we're looking at this, this is that little picture of acetylcholine, ACH. When we're using scopolamine, it's one of those things that's used for motion sickness, and we're looking at anticholinesterases, right? We're looking at these types of medications and their compounds. And then we're looking at tertiary, right, compounds here. So here you see scopolamine and atropine being tertiary compounds. Uh, tertiary compounds, remember, have a lot are a lot more easily absorbed in the bloodstream, and they will cross the blood-brain barrier. So atropine and scopolamine would be your big ones here, uh, and this as well. So you're going to see the compounds are, are a lot more um, detailed than what we've seen before. So what are your clinical indications for using these medications? So uh, let's talk about it as a bronchodilator, right? A backdoor bronchodilator, as someone once told me. Uh, COPD maintenance is going to be one of your key ones here. Uh, and there's some evidence out there uh, on asthma as well for this, but let's just focus on COPD maintenance. Uh, patients with asthma who aren't responding to beta 2s, right, have poor response or unresponsive to beta 2s. So there's a little bit of asthma stuff there as well. But traditionally, anticholinergics are more designed for that, that chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patient, the emphysema, uh, chronic bronchitis type patient. Uh, when you're using it in combination with the beta-2 agonist, that's the second um, big point here, uh, COPD with airway obstruction, obviously. Uh, so they're on in albuterol, and they might add an atrovent to it, uh, your dunab traditionally, right? Um, a patient with asthma who aren't responding well to beta-2 agonist, notice there's a theme here with that part. Right, uh, so we're seeing that if they're not responding well to beta two agonist with asthma, that we can give it a shot. We can try it, right? And then finally, when we're looking at this last one, is going to be something like just a nasal spray, especially you're allergic or a non-allergic rhinitis, right? That's going on. Their nose is running like crazy. The common cold. It could help them so that way that can control and make it more comfortable for them during that whole procedure. Maybe avoid other things like that cough from the nasal drip. Uh, that could be beneficial to some of these patients. So using this in COPD is going to be one of your primary ones. It's a more potent bronchodilation than adrenergic medications. More potent bronchodilation than adrenergic in emphysema and chronic bronchitis. So this is where it becomes very important that they look at this category. So currently as a recording this, the evidence shows that there's better bronchodilation with an atrovent versus an albuterol in emphysema and chronic bronchitis, right? There's better use with that that parasympatholytic bronch, uh, uh, bronchodilation versus a sympathomimetic bronchodilation. The FDA specifically approved this medication class for uh, COPD when we're looking at this. And then Spiriva, teotropium bromide, maintains better or higher PFT levels than ipitropium. So that's why you might see a lot of patients, especially COPD patients, on that. 
But why? What's the whole point of that person having a better response? Like, how is that a better response than attribute? If they're both in the same category, why is Spiriva better? Well, Spiriva, remember, it will bind to M1 and M3, and it's specific to M1 and M3. And that's something that will help them in the long run because it has a more specific effect on their system than just attribute. Yes, attribute works on the same way of blocking muscarinic sites, but this one blocks specific muscarinic sites that will have more benefit. And that's why it showed better improvement in pulmonary function values on those patients. All right, what about asthma, right? Uh, currently, as of recording this, there was no label indication for asthma. Uh, asthma is still considered that beta agonists are superior. Uh, for their management overall, but it may be useful. It may be useful for things like nocturnal asthma, where they need that longer effect, uh, psychogenic asthma, right, uh, that anxiety or emotionally induced, because uh, what happens with an emotionally triggered asthma is they have that emotional trigger, whether it's stress or something, uh, which will lead to vagal nerve stimulation, uh, and then that vagal nerve stimulation uh, will then cause a, an excessive release of bronco of acetylcholine, which will then cause that the bronchi to become smaller, and therefore there's your effect, right? So that that psychogenic asthma is a component to think about there, where they could go ahead and give them that uh, anticholinergic medication. Uh, asthmatics with comorbidities, of course. Um, Beta blockers, especially for uh, for heart disease, uh, something to think about there. Uh, if the patient's on beta blockers, and they are, are they going to be as prone to respond to beta stimulation that you see with sympathetic medications? No, they're not going to be able to respond as easily if they're on beta blockers for uh, to decrease blood pressure. So when we're looking at this, that might be a better indication for that asthmatic that's on a beta blocker, right, that's on that antihypertensive medicine to get a, a parasympatholytic. Uh, that way they have bronchodilation effect. And we're using a different system. We're using the muscarinic system of blocking it so they get the sympathetic effect without having to worry about beta-2 receptor sites and making sure that we get those. Uh, we can also think about this as alternatives to other medications like your xanthines, like theophylline. Uh, if we get that alternative to that there. Uh, theophylline or xanthine, remember, it can cause GI upsetness. It can cause a lot of other things too. But uh, when we're looking at this, it might be a good alternative because that therapeutic window for that xanthine is a little narrow. So we might have better success with some patients doing an anticholinergic with asthma versus uh, being on a theophylline or xanthine. Uh, acute severe episodes not responding to adrenergic drugs, of course we talked about this already. Uh, if they're not responding to their bronchodilating nebulizers, then we can give try this medication, add it to it, and see if that can work, right? So if they're unresponsive, asthmatics that's unresponsive, then we can get it a, a shot. So inhaled anticholinergic bronchodilators, once again we're focusing on the respiratory side of this. Uh, would be ipitropium bromide, uh, ipitropium bromide in albuterol. Uh, some people call that duoneb or it comes combined together. There can be a difference in the albuterol dosage uh, as well with that, so be careful. Uh, Teotropium bromide, uh, and then you got your other two down here um, that you'll see as well, more of your maintenance ones that you'll see. But remember, most of your indications for these anticholinergic bronchodilators is going to be in COPD emphysema, right? And that's where you get most of your effect from in those patients, right? So that's why you might see this more as, uh, in your COPD ears. Now, could you see them in your asthmatic patients? Of course, right? But uh, usually those are your asthmatic patients that are unresponsive to bronchodilating medicines and or inhaled corticosteroids. All right, let's talk about combination therapy. Uh, let's make sure this one's red. Combination therapy. This is a kind of a big slide, right? So I'm going to do a couple different colors, right? Uh, combination therapy is a big deal. Uh, these medications 
are synergistic. They're synergistic. I know, fancy word. But that means that they, they're complementary to the sites of action, which means with an anticholinergic effect uh, is seen more in the central airways, the beta agonist effects is seen in the smaller airways. So now we're looking at effects on both the larger airways and the smaller airways. So we're combining the best of both worlds, not just for one area of the lung. We're looking at most of the conducting airways and the transition to respiratory zone in some cases. So we're looking at more lung tissue sites. Once again, why are they synergistic? They're, they're affecting more lung tissue surface area. Once again, they're affecting more lung tissue surface area, right? So that's a big bonus, right? They're synergistic. So they, uh, their mode of action is still gonna be separate, right? But they're just gonna complement each other. One's gonna work on the larger, like the anticholinergic, and the other ones are gonna work at the smaller, the beta agonist. We will work on the smaller, right, airways. Um, their peak will increase. Uh, what does that mean, right? Uh, when we're looking at this, this means they'll have a quicker onset, right? They'll have a quicker onset. So that's awesome, right? A quicker onset. So this patient comes in, they might do better using a duo NEM than just an albuterol, than just an atrovent, right? They might do better because now we have that synergy and it's going to have a lot faster onset with it. And the beta agonist will peak and terminate sooner, but the anticholinergics tend to peak more slowly and last longer, so they're gonna have more sustained effect from the medication. Once again, more sustained effect from the medication. So it's gonna be very beneficial, right? Now, when we're giving them an administration order, you're always going to make sure that you give the steroid last unless they have an anti-infective agent, especially on the boards, uh, if there's an anti-infective, you want to make sure the airways are as open as clear as possible before that. But usually the steroid is the last medication you give. So you'd start with your bronchodilators, uh, your maintenance medications, right? Your steroids would be last, and then uh, unless they have an anti-infective, then that would be the last. So hopefully you got the synergistic part out and understand, hey, doing a synergistic uh, approach is appropriate in some situations. So let's talk about our drug tables, right? These are putting together the medications in this category. So ipatropium bromide uh, is available as an inhaler, a meter dose inhaler, a small volume neb, a nasal spray, and this one's approved for the maintenance or the treatment of obstruction in COPD, right? And it's like we've already talked about, most of this is going to be COPD related, and asthma, if they're not responsive or not well controlled with just their uh, inhaled corticosteroid and or bronchodilator. Uh, remember, ipatropium bromide is quaternary, which means less CNS side effects. <gasps> yes, we're learning things today. It's awesome. So ipatropium bromide and albuterol. Uh, this is available as an MDI, small volume neb, soft mist, right, all those things. This one is a combination therapy, which gives you the whole thing of synergism, right? These are more effective and stable COPD than either agent alone, all right? So I need you to circle this in your notes. I need you to put uh, stars next to it or exclamation points. Uh, whatever it is, right? Remember that this is more effective in stable COPD than any e agent, e any of these either agents alone. So they work better as a team than they do as independent partners, right? They work better as a team than doing independent work, right? They love working as a team, right? When, as a team, they can get more work done. So when we combine these two together, that's where it comes into play. And that's why you'll see a lot of patients out there, right, on this dual medication route. So let's talk about Q-Day anticholinergics. Once again, these are more of your maintenance ones that are out there. Um, so there is uh, these, the M1, teotropium bromide is the big one here that uh, I've seen a lot of studies on there, but M1 and M3 specific, right, cross that M2. M1 and M3 
specific, right? M1 and M3 specific. Uh, it's available in your dry powder inhaler. There's also the soft mist version out there. Um, and then there's this other ones that you'll see out there. Um, these ones, you'll see, like I said, maintenance medications. They're on here. Um, but they can be very useful in patients, and usually these are going to be DPI. So this slide... And this slide. So when you're looking at this one, you're looking at these DPIs, and these are very, very potent antagonists for muscarinic receptors, very potent antagonists for muscarinic receptors. So these are going to be primarily for your maintenance and treatments in COPD. Well, let me ask you this. What drug do you has been shown when nebulized to COPD patient populations uh, to decrease lung function? What drug has been shown when nebulized to COPD patient populations has been shown to decrease pulmonary function tests. It is mucomist, it's acetylcysteine. So that's one medication we try to avoid nebulizing to these patients in COPD because it's shown to actually decrease their pulmonary function. It's been shown to be harmful to them. So that's, hey, a little bonus. I could easily ask you what type of medication should not be given to uh, nebulize to someone with COPD. And that would be one that I would uh, think should be on that list because it's been shown as of this recording that uh, that could be detrimental to those patients. Glycopyrrolate, right, uh, is a quaternary ammonium derivative. Once again, quaternary, what does that mean to you? That means less blood-brain barrier issues, less CNS side effects issues, great for inhaled medication. Uh, and this used primarily to reverse a neuromuscular blo blockade. So this is not approved for inhalation. This is used uh, systemically to help reverse a paralytic. Um, but they also can use to help control drooling in pediatric patients with cerebral palsy. Um, that, like I said before, it has fewer CNS side effects than atropine, so that's why it could be very helpful, especially in those like pediatric patients to help control things like saliva production and stuff like that as well. But once again, this one, less CNS side effects because of that quaternary component. Atropine, we did talk about this already a little bit here. This is not recommended for inhalation. Do not do this for inhalation, right? Not recommended for inhalation. It is used, uh, one of the drugs used in ACLS for cardiac arrest. Uh, you can use it for pulseless electrical activity. Uh, asystole is a drug, right? We're not shocking during asystole, but can we still give medications? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we just got to make sure we cycle it with good perfusion somehow, right? Usually it's going to be manual perfusion. Um, symptomatic bradycardia is the big one here. Symptomatic bradycardia. The max dose is going to be about three milligrams, but the big worry here, I'm going to mention it again, is going to be your atropine flush, right? And that can cause major, major vasodilation, which then could decrease blood pressure. So something you got to worry about. However, most of the time we've already pushed a lot of epinephrine, which vasoconstricts as well. So something to think about here. Once again, I am so thankful for our pharmacy friends that show up to codes as well. Uh, they can help us with this. But once again, atropine is going to be one of your uh, direct acting ones, and it's going to be uh, primarily for your symptomatic bradycardia. Can we use it in other situations? Absolutely, but that's going to be primarily where you see there. And the big concern would be the atropine flush. So adverse effects of inhaled, right? We're talking about inhaled. I and H, inhaled. Uh, adverse effects of inhaled drugs here. Uh, the dry mouth is going to be the biggest one. This is your biggest side effect, right, is a dry mouth. So the biggest side effect of Spiriva, Atrovent, uh, any of these other COPD maintenance medications here in this drug category are going to be that dry mouth. Dry mouth is going to be the big, biggest one. Now, they can have a cough as well, and a cough is one of those ways, uh, used to be on the old board exams, they would ask, how did you know that the patient got the medication from an inhaler, right? Well, the answer was a cough, because that stimulated their airways. The medication went ahead and stimulated their airways, and it caused that cough. 
but a cough can be present because it is stimulating their airways. Uh, mydriasis, right? Mydriasis means what? Uh, their pupils got bigger, right? Because we're blocking it, right? We're blocking the parasympathetic stimulation. So you can easily see mydriasis on these patients. Um, if you're giving it via small volume nebulizer, you can see some pharyngitis. Uh, sometimes they might get dyspnea or flu-like symptoms, right? That can happen with it. And that's just common for the mode of action or the pathology that it's working. Uh, other things that you gotta watch out for uh, that could happen, but usually aren't present in, a, in most cases, would be changes in their blood pressure, their EKG or heart rate. So those changes, uh, very, very rare. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible, right? That their heart rate could go up with a parasympatholytic, right? Is it possible that they could show some changes in their blood pressure? It's possible, but not very likely because usually they're not very well systemically absorbed. Um, you should not see a decrease in their pulse ox, unlike the sympathomimetics. Um, so you shouldn't see a change there. And then finally, uh, you shouldn't see any tolerance or loss of receptors, but like what we talked about with the sympathetic stimulators, right? So there's a good compare and contrast moment for you there. And finally, let's talk about our respiratory assessment uh, with these patients. Uh, how do we assess that these medications are appropriate, that they're working, that they're, the patient should continue on these medication pathways? Well, one of the things is going to be looking at their ABG and their pulse ox, right? We're going to make sure that, hey, they're ventilating more efficiently at baseline. They're oxygenating more efficiently at baseline. Uh, so we can see that there. Uh, traditionally, the ABG is not done just pre and post spareva, right? <laughs> but uh, over time, we can see that, hey, every, every once every year if that person comes in for an ABG in the pulmonary function lab, hey, their blood gases on on average are better, right? Their pulse ox non-invasively on average is better now that they've been on this medication for a longer period of time. Um, and a lot of COPDers will have pulse oxes nowadays, which is a good advantage and a bad, th advantage, bad thing as well. But you can always see that they're trending better, right? That could be a sign that they're breathing better with it. The long-term PFTs is the most precise way of looking at this because we can see precisely what's going on with their airways. Uh, is their, uh, their flow rates changing uh, for the better or for the worse, right? Uh, the other thing, too, is making sure that we educate the patient on when to use these, when it's appropriate, when it may not be appropriate, when to consider talking to their doctor about stopping this medication, especially if they get really thick, sticky mucus, uh, things like that. They might have to talk to their physician for that. So educating the patient on this. And then the potential side effects is something that we need to educate the patient on as well. For long-acting drugs, uh, especially PFTs, are your gold standard for looking at not only their baseline, but how they're doing since their baseline. Um, we can look at the beta-2 use for nocturnal symptoms as well. Um, the beta-2 use as well. Exacerbations, hospitalizations, have they used less bronchodilators uh, since they started taking their Spareva? Have they had less hospitalizations? Have they had less exacerbations since taking this medication or since starting this medication and its effectiveness? Uh, are they absent from school uh, less? Uh, are they showing up for school more days? Are they showing up for work more days? Are they missing less of their work? then those could be all signs that this medication is impactful for them and that they should continue it. So big things to look at here, and I want you to think about as you summarize this in your notes, uh, try to do a little short summary and think about what are some compare and contrast moments between sympathetic and parasympathetic. I want you to think about how this one will slow conduction, decrease heart rate, constricts, stimulates secretions, increase saliva production, and how we, how we, what miscarinic receptor sites are specific to the lungs and how we block those, what medications are anti-muscarinics, what's my difference between tertiary and quaternary compounds, um, what is sludge syndrome, what can happen if there is an overproduction of, uh, of this anticholinergics, right, what is uh, something that we can do besides respiratory system where we use 
these medications that stimulate this, right? What about medications that block this outside the respiratory system like we talked about with atropine? So those are some of the things I want you to sort of use in a summary and hopefully that will help you out with making sure you got the general ideas of the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system and anticholinergics uh, information down.